Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Thank you. Thanks for the uh, invitation, and I'll be happy to tell you today about a research uh, project and an open source uh, system that we have been developing at TU Berlin. But uh, maybe first, if this works, well, I guess it doesn't. Okay, now it does. Uh, first, uh, I th I'm sure all of you know about uh, data and analysis being coming increasingly complex and all have heard about those V's of big data. But what I'm believing is that that's really missing an important part of the equation if we only talk about data volume, velocity, variability, and veracity. We already have heard in Gerhard's talk uh, before, and also in Natasha's talk, a lot about this is really about the analysis. And with respect to the analysis, there's a lot of existing systems out there that are pretty good in essentially conducting relational operations or some subset thereof, like selection and grouping, like MapReduce, or relational databases that can do joins and correlations, but also applying some more complex user-defined functions like you need in ETL or information integration. But we more and more see the requirement, if you do data analytics, that you have to go into the space of implementing machine learning algorithms, optimization algorithms, or even more predictive models. And there's a new class of problems, in particular if you look at things from a data processing perspective, mm -hmm. that those two types of analysis operations require. And that is iterations and state. And that's very uh, novel or very different from traditional database systems that usually follow a data flow that is stateless and doesn't involve, involve iterations. And the reason uh, for that is because you want to automatically optimize, parallelize, and execute the operations. You don't want to program, uh, burden the programmer with those. And what one of my students did is in this space now looking at what are kind of systems that are emerging in the space. So it's missing a couple of uh, recent ones. So it's, for instance, missing GraphLab here on this chart. And it's also missing a new development here from Microsoft uh, NIAD. But essentially, what you see here in the stack, you see, on the one hand, relational databases. You see novel uh, systems classified according to the query and scripting languages, some higher level API that ideally has some form of declarative features, as well as uh, what, comp uh, what the compiler technology, lower level API, and execution engine is. And the interesting observation is there's the traditional database systems that usually have some scalability issue. And then there's this very popular MapReduce paradigm, which on uh, my viewpoint is essentially a very efficient and a very good implementation of a scalable parallel sort algorithm. Mm -hmm. And you can obviously do a lot if you have sorted data. You can apply a lot of different aspects to it. Then there is uh, SQL variants that are implemented on top of those systems. There is uh, also some uh, scripting languages with essentially hard code a query plan. And the reason why I'm saying that is so a database system like in a, in a language like SQL has the big advantage that you specify your query declaratively. It's independent of your execution strategy, what physical operator order you have, and how it depends on particular data sets. It's not dependent on that. There's a component in that system called the query optimizer that will automatically select the right strategy. But if you do query plan scripting, then you hard code such a plan and your data uh, may really influence your performance very heavily because you have geared your algorithms to a particular size of data sets or distribution. Then there's column stores that are currently very much in fashion and uh, uh, there's also systems that uh, follow a more vertex-centric programming model like, like, like Pregel, which essentially also, and we'll see that later, there's hard code a specific career execution strategy in a system like uh, Stratosphere. And then there's a breed of new systems. We'll hear about a couple of those, I believe, during the next couple of days that are more on the right side here, like, like Scope. Then there's the Stratosphere stack. Then there's another stack from the University of Irvine called Asterix. And there's the Spark uh, stack in Berkeley. So... With that, however, I want to now focus on one specific of those more novel stacks uh, that, is, that are being developed, and that's the one that my team at TU Berlin, together with other researchers in Berlin and also across Europe, are building, and it's called the Stratosphere System, which is a layered and flexible stack for massively parallel data management. I'll introduce a programming model to you, how this programming model is optimized. Essentially, it's declarative, so that's the important part here, and so it can be automatically op optimized. And then I will talk about this important 
new class of problems that one has to tackle in data analysis, which are iterative algorithms, if I still have time for that. Otherwise, I will speed through that. So, but first, let's talk about the stratosphere system stack. So it's really a layered approach where there's several entry points into the system. So there's some scripting languages. There's a Scala front end so that you can write your data analysis programs in a language like Scala. And there's a lower level interface and I focus more on the lower parts of the system which is uh, there's a specific programming model called PACT which is based on second order functions. And I will tell you how this is being implemented and realized. But on the bottom level of the system, there is a parallel data flow engine that allows for massively parallel executions on hundreds of nodes. And uh, this parallel data flow engine, it takes care of resource allocation, scheduling, task communication, fault tolerance, and execution monitoring. <coughs> on top of that, there's a runtime engine that takes care of memory management, asynchronous I.O., and in particular implements the typical query execution algorithms, like how do you do sorting, how do you do hashing, how do you integrate and combine various data sets <coughs> with join operations. So this is what the runtime operator does. It really implements essentially the functionality that one would expect in a parallel database. And that's a big difference if you look at uh, systems like the very popular Hadoop stack where you don't have those kinds of primitives and you don't have pipeline execution which can be uh, dealt with in this case as well. And then there's a optimizer which based on the program specification, the data analysis program specification, selects the physical execution strategies and uh, partitioning strategies and also the order in which operators should be executed. And with that, I want to briefly motivate <coughs> to you a programming model for specifying this data analysis programs that goes beyond what uh, the rational algebra, the prime uh, language for data analysis is. And the reason for why we go beyond that is because of first complex user-defined functions and later I'll extend it for iterations. But First, let's talk about parallelization contracts. So essentially, this was motivated by this uh, big data programming model called MapReduce, the MapReduce programming model popularized by Google, which essentially is a very simplified language of second order functional programs. It's really second order functional programming. Because what one does in, the, in this context is one has a second order function that will take as an input a first order function and a set, and the set is usually in the MapReduce model identified by key value pairs. And in this context, uh, a second order function named map, what that one does, the second order function named map, it will t build independent subsets for each input. So that means if you have a map, each key value pair that is part of the processing can be processed independently so that a first order function can be applied to each key value pair independently of another one. And what this allows for is for embarrassingly parallel processing because it means if you had n processors and you had n uh, data items, every one of them could in theory be processed independently. So embarrassingly parallel. Similarly, there's another second order function called reduce and the reduced second order function, what that one does, it takes a key and it groups everything around that key. Everything that has the same key will be processed together by a second order function. So those are the common uh, second order functions popular in the MapReduce programming model and used in uh, the Hadoop system. The interesting observation is that those are two certain classes of functions. So the first function, map, is a record at a time function. So it processes each record and it's one dimensional because it only has one input and reduce processes, uh, processes are set at a time, namely everything that has the same key. And uh, again, it's only one input. And if you have those two functions, you can efficiently implement grouping and aggregation and uh, applying a lot of complex user-defined functions on those. So what we did in the context of stratospheres, we generalized this model by saying there's not only those two second order functions named map but reduce, there's some others that are important. And in particular, if you look at what's needed uh, in order to have at least a full-blown relational system with user-defined functions, you need uh, second order functions that take more than one set as input. And there is now some additional, uh, what we call parallelization contracts, so second order functions that uh, can be used for data analysis. So the first one is called a cross. And what that does, essentially, it builds a Cartesian product, but note it's not a Cartesian product because it applies a first order function on each combination. So essentially it's a record at a time function that's two dimensional because it takes two inputs, it combines everything and applies a user defined function on each input. 
The next one is cogroup, which essentially is a two-dimensional reduce, which is a set at a time function that takes two inputs and it groups everything together. So what you see here as an example is, uh, so cross essentially everything that comes together like this one and this one forms an independent group. This one and this one forms an independent group. With uh, a cogroup, this one and this one, they are grouped together. They're coming from two different input sets, but they're grouped together. Well, those three, this one, this one, and this one are grouped together. And the first order function is applied on those. There's an additional one which we call match, which is not necessarily needed except for efficiency, uh, which brings together everything that has the same key and in this case performs a distributed equijoin, which is also a record at a time function that's two-dimensional. So the interesting thing is if you have those three additional parallelization contracts, plus map and reduce, then you can implement the functions that you already uh, know from the relational algebra, selection, projection, grouping, uh, aggregation, efficiently, and you don't have to hard code you don't have to hard code any particular operation like what you would do in a typical MapReduce environment. Uh, you would have to implement if you want to perform a join. This would be done by actually uh, using some tricks like distributed caches or you have to tag the inputs, which doesn't allow for automatic optimization. Because what you have to note here, this doesn't tell you anything about the execution, how it's parallelized, how it's processed. And you have different ways how that can be done. And how it is done will depend on data distribution, will depend on the number of processors, the data sizes of various sets. So all of that plays a role. And the power of such an approach is you can do that in a declarative fashion. It's different, however, from what is done in a database system and in a relational system, because each time you do that, you have to apply a second order function. So you cannot use the standard techniques because you don't really know that a certain operation is a selection or a projection or a join, because it's only telling you how things are grouped together and then processed together. So with that, you can now wire together arbitrarily complex, if you wish, data flows of those second order functions which essentially could be you have some sources, you apply map, then you apply a match that brings those together. And what you see here is uh, the first order function that's given, and then you have a reduce, and then you have an output. So a PEG program is an arbitrary data flow, acyclic graph, that consists of operators, where each operator has a second order function signature, and a user-defined first order function that's usually written in Java. So it's essentially really a generalization of the MapReduce programming model. And we have some scripting languages on top of that, like Meteor Scala that automatically compile into this kind of language that's used by the system. Now, I want to talk about some specific aspects that uh, we can do because we have this richer language. And I should maybe point out before I go there though, so there is some more second order functions that you could think of that do define, for instance, overlapping partitionings that you might want to use for matrix operations of a time series analysis. So you don't have to stop at those paths. So those are the ones that we currently implemented, but we're currently exploring further ones for different uh, operations. With that, I want to talk about one specific piece of work that we have done for the system, which is one paper that was published at VLDB last year. And that is about how we now can automatically optimize and find the best strategy for how to parallelize and execute those functions and then programs. And the overall idea for the stratosphere system is that there's a cost-based optimizer. So it's similar to how the things are done in language compilers, but combine compiler technology from programming languages with the database query optimization technology. So we have a cost-based optimizer, which essentially tries to attribute a certain cost with each operation. And uh, this is dependent on uh, data characteristics, but of course also the specific operations. And this cost-based optimizer will produce a physical execution plan that will decide on caching, on broadcasting, and, and data uh, shipping strategies. And it will annotate the edges of this data flow graph with distribution patterns, like should it be a broadcast or a partitioned operation. It will determine the physical execution strategies. Should it be a hash-based or a sort-based algorithm in this particular context? And it will reorder the functions if a certain different order is more cost-effective. Like a typical example would be you want to early reduce the data set so that later on you don't have so much data to handle with. So you want to automatically apply those reorderings when it makes sense. And then it will construct for this Nephila execution engine this job graph that will automatically be executed. So, but the challenge in this context is now how can we identify how and when we could reorder operators? 
because the problem is in contrast to a well-defined data analysis language like relational algebra, the semantics of the user-defined functions is unknown in this context. So the question is really how can we define or derive correct transformations and how can we cost those? Because it's really about user-defined functions optimization. And the way that is done is really using compiler technology. So we, we do static code analysis in each of those first order functions that are like, think of your map, first order function implementation, or reduce first order function implementation, and we extract properties from those. And based on those properties, we derive semantically correct transformations. We enumerate semantically equivalent plans. And in this way, we really show how one can deeply embed map reduce functions to query optimizer so that the user doesn't have to worry about in which order to write operators. And it's actually not only relevant to the stratosphere system, but it's relevant also would apply to systems like scope or any system that combines complex data analysis operations with a map reduce or user defined function uh, context. So it's done by a static code analysis and I'll give you an example. So what you see here is the code of a specific implementation of a match operation that takes two records as an input, a left and a right record, and well, there's some collector, which is uh, essentially the output. And the way that is done using a specific API, this API, it has uh, get, copy, and, and, uh, and also set operations. And in this way, we can determine using static code analysis, is data being accessed or changed? So it's feasible to do the static code analysis because we have a record data model with a fixed API and there is no control flow between operators. So this is still a data flow model. This is important. It's a functional programming model. So it's, a se it's second order functions that call first order functions that have no side effect. And only then you can do those automatic optimizations. That's also a difference. So that's why you could not easily do those kinds of optimizations in, the, in a system like Hadoop automatically, because if you want to join, you very often use some things like distributed caches, which have side effects, and then you could not apply those kinds of reorderings anymore. And the difficulty comes now, of course, that you have different code paths because we have some if statements that we don't really know which code path has been used. But we can ensure correctness in this context through conservatism. So that means we want we determine basically a union of all possible code paths and determine which data items are read, which data items are written, and based on that we can determine reorderings. So what we did there is we identify an output schema uh, for a record that tells us how will the output record look like. We determine a read set that gives us the attributes of the input records that might influence the output and the write set that are the attributes of the output records that might have different values from respective input out uh, attributes. And thus we arrive at an emit cardinality uh, which tells us and we only need to know how many records do we get as an output of a map or reduce or whatever function. Because if we know that information, is it one, more than one, or potentially also less than one, we can use that information. So with that, we can use our code analysis algorithm and what that essentially does, and you see that here we determine what we call a read set and the write set of attributes. The read set we get from the get statements and also from the copy statements and the write set from the set statements. And you see, for instance, that this particular program it uh, has a read set A, B, C, D, F, and has a write set B, C if the record, if the left record is A, B, C, and uh, the uh, right record has the schema of D, E, F. So if we have that information and we do uh, get the emit cardinality also by uh, traversing the control flow graph backwards, which is in this case emit cardinality is one, then we have read and write sets. And the interesting observation is that that's a very powerful concept to know. If we know those read and write sets, we can actually pick partitioning strategies just from the packed signature, we, uh, which is essentially just knowing uh, what are the input and output of, uh, records. And that means we can automatically decide, should we use a broadcast strategy, a partitioning strategy, a symmetric fragment replicate joins with our physical methods, that otherwise, if you write data analysis programs in a system like Hadoop, you kind of hard code those aspects if you do complex analysis inside your map or reduce function. You have to hard code those operations in your map or reduce functions or you don't even have that choice. Or here in this case, we use a FIFO, which is really a pipelining or streaming operation. So you don't have blocking operations and don't have to materialize data in a distributed file system. So in this way, one can infer uh, the partitionings and one can also get rid of operations that would happen if you don't have that, like you can eliminate sorting operations that otherwise would occur. 
and operators can be reordered, and in this way we can arrive at what would be an optimal execution plan with respect to a particular model of cost. The interesting observation is that in this model, we can do what could be done in typical relational databases without knowing that we have uh, relational operations. We can do selection push down, uh, projection push down, uh, uh, rally uh, grouping, and join reordering. All of those can be determined just using those properties, even though we are not knowing that this is a join operation or selection. This is just first order and second order functions. So it's a very powerful model. And there's some proofs that are in this VLDB 2012 paper that show us that two map operations can be reordered if their UDFs have only read-read conflicts. And for a map and reduce, uh, if the groups are preserved, we can do reordering. And as I already mentioned, we can do selection push down, join reordering, aggregation push down. And even more, there's also a possibility to reorder non-relational reduce functions. So it gives a lot of power to the system and it relieves the programmer, the data analyst, the data scientist, from a lot of uh, burdens when writing data analysis programs. So this is the first uh, part. And now I very briefly go over the second part. So if we have arrived at that, we have a system that can efficiently process complex user-defined functions. And it does not require the user to worry about the physical implementations. The person who is a data scientist doesn't have to be a systems programmer anymore, can really focus on specifying the uh, code in the, pr uh, in the problem domain. It doesn't worry about joint strategies, joint orders, and so on. Now, the second aspect is that a lot of algorithms, in particular machine learning, optimization, algebraic algorithms, uh, require iterative queries. So there's essentially an iteration going on. And in stratosphere, uh, the system has a concept of two different kinds of iterations. So the first one we call bulk iteration. So in general, the concept of an iteration is that you recompute the state at each iteration and you change it. So the, the concept that's how that's done in stratosphere is by introducing a higher order function, which is an iteration function, which is on top of those map, reduce, match, co-group, and so on functions. And what that means is you now have not data flow acyclic graphs, but those graphs can have certain cycles, which give a feedback that is uh, defining an iteration that goes on until a convergence criteria has been met. An example here, you see in, uh, here, this would be an implementation of page rank in the stratosphere system. So you have essentially your uh, constant data path, which is your uh, pages. Then you have your rank vector, which is initialized in some way. Those two are brought together. And then there's a reduce function going on that uh, creates this, the partial ranks. And then this operation continues until a convergence criteria is met. And this is the dynamic data path because this modified rank vector goes into the next iteration. And here's a stopping condition that has to be checked. So the interesting observation is that in su such a kind of a program, you have a static and a dynamic uh, data path or constant data path. And in, 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 uh, if you use uh, a system like Hadoop uh, uh, or, main, or most other systems, you would write an external driver loop that you write in Java or so that calls the code for the iteration regularly. The problem is if you do that, first of all, you may not choose the right uh, implementation strategy for the interior com uh, computation because this could be a complex program here, for instance, right, in the constant path. And at the same time, you might not be able to identify uh, the right way of how you ship the data because in some cases you don't want to materialize the data into a distributed file system between each iteration. You could just pipeline the data onto the next iteration, which will give you tremendous performance improvements. So, and that is a decision that, again, can be done by the, by the optimizer automatically. So as a programmer, you don't have to worry about it. You really write your programs as those kind of uh, second order uh, functions. And then you have this iteration construct in the language. So you choose your language like Scala, and you have an iterate uh, construct on top of that. And then uh, the data scientist doesn't have to worry about that. So the interesting observation is that this shows you also the power of such a system. Those here are two optimizer plans. So this is really an internal representation of what the optimizer would do with different ways of how you, in this case, uh, here you build a, a hash table and then you pipeline the results. And here, in this case, you do a partitioning and sorting. Those are two different implementations of how you compute page rank. And the interesting observation is one of those is uh, how it is implemented in a specific system called Pegasus. 
And the other one, uh, which is essentially following the direct uh, proposal by Google, how to implement PageRank, which works very well if uh, one part of the data is uh, fairly large. And the other one is an implementation that's used in the Mahout machine learning library on Herpa Hadoop, but it's hard-coded. And uh, that one is used if the rank vector is fairly small. But as a data scientist, you wouldn't want to worry which of those implementations you would choose. But this here is really an internal representation that the system would come up with for a generic specification of page rank. So you, again, the data scientist doesn't have to worry about it. That's the power of having a more declarative specification that just requires the second order functions. There's another class of uh, data analysis algorithms, and I will go through that very, very briefly only for the sake of time, that uh, do not update the entire data set in place like page rank would do you update the entire vector. But you actually each time add some new aspects. This is, uh, means that you have some sparse computational dependencies that you can exploit. Really, you change the state at each iteration on parts of the, uh, that changed at the previous iteration. The most simple example would actually be computing a transitive closure each time you add some new things, right, until you don't add anything anymore. A very common example would be connected components. This is just an example of a connected components algorithm that I will not go into detail. The important aspect is that for those kinds of algorithms, you don't have to transfer and communicate this, this really complex state at each time. At incremental iterations, you can actually split those up. And the question is, can the system do that automatically? We are currently working on that so far. Uh, a data analyst would still have to decide either it's uh, incremental iteration or bulk iteration, but the goal would be to automate that decision. Uh, but what that means, you can split up your computation into a work set and a solution set. And this work set and the solution set uh, are used to compute a delta that is the new additions to the solution or the changes to the solution that happened during an iteration. And that will happen until uh, there's a convergence reached. So this shows tremendous speed ups. All of those details are in the paper. The important thing I only want to point out, in this case, a very specific system like Pregel is then a query plan in a system like Stratosphere. So Pregel is a very specialized implemented system for graph analysis. In Stratosphere, it's just a query plan that the optimizer will come up with if the specification requires such a particular solution. With that, I conclude. So Stratosphere, so I did really only give you some internal overview, but it's, it's a whole system. It's actually running. It's available open source under the Apache license. It's a generalization of Hadoop. So if you're familiar with Hadoop, uh, you can easily use it. In particular, if you just would use the map and reduce functions, it's just the same. But you can do much more with it because you have those additional higher order functions and you have those additional capabilities of doing iterations. With that, I thank you very much and uh, look forward if there are any questions. <laughs>